Hi, everybody. Thank you, uh, Peter, for the opportunity to come and speak with everybody today. I do have just a few slides. Um, okay, so is everybody able to see my slides okay? Fantastic. So um, as Peter said, I'm one of the um, pediatric infectious disease attendings at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital uh, and an associate professor at the School of Medicine. I'm part of a couple of different task forces that is working on uh, COVID vaccine implementation and just wanted to share a little bit about sort of the current state of things um, right now um, and then answer questions that anybody in the group might have. So just to kind of level set, I wanted to remind everyone that there are a variety of different coronavirus vaccines that are currently in development. What's really had the most attention most recently have been the mRNA, so-called messenger RNA vaccines that are being developed by Pfizer um, and Moderna. And this is just a little cartoon to give you a sense of how each of these work. But as a reminder, these mRNA vaccines are really based on the delivery of messenger RNA that codes for a specific protein that's part of the virus. Um, that protein gets made and your body develops a response to that protein, which then develops um, protection against uh, the virus. What, uh, what really, uh, in, in terms of where things are right now with the vaccines, the one that's sort of furthest along is the Pfizer vaccine. And you've probably all heard in the media that there will be an FDA meeting tomorrow actually uh, with what's called BRPAC, which is one of the advisory committees for the FDA to talk about an emergency use authorization that Pfizer um, has requested for their vaccine. If you take a look at their emergency use uh, authorization requests, um, they're looking to deploy this vaccine in patients who are at least 16 years of age. This is a vaccine that would be given as two doses that are 21 days apart. And earlier this week, Pfizer released um, the data to uh, help support their emergency use authorization requests. And I've just kind of put a few highlights of what that data tells us. Um, as I think most people have heard in the media, the virus, this vaccine um, is highly efficacious. Um, if we look at the risk for confirmed COVID-19, at least one week after that second dose of vaccine, it appears that the vaccine has an efficacy, e efficacy, efficacy of about 95%. Um, but it does turn out that the vaccine is also pretty efficacious even after the first dose and the time between the first and second dose. There's also been shown to be a, re a, redu a reduction in the risk of severe COVID-19 um, uh, following that second dose of vaccine. Um, and importantly, there really haven't been any specific safety concerns. Uh, they followed up patients who got um, the, uh, who participated in the trial and received this vaccine for a median of about two months after that second dose of vaccine and really didn't see a signal of any specific safety concerns. Um, there are the kind of adverse reactions that you would expect after a vaccine, things like fever, um, injection, uh, discomfort at the site of the injection, fatigue that tended to be more common actually among younger patients um, and after that second dose of vaccine, which has some important implications that I'll talk about later. In terms of the allocation of the vaccine, I think most people are aware that because of the limited supply of vaccine, this is really going to be a phased approach. And um, particularly during this first phase, the priority is going to be um, in uh, providers who are working in the healthcare setting. Um, and then based on recommendations that were recently released from the ACIP, um, also focusing on um, providers and patients in long-term care facilities like nursing homes. So that's the so-called phase 1A, um, and this will be followed by phase 1B where we're looking at essential workers and other uh, high-risk populations. And all of this phase is before there are larger number, uh, a larger number of, of vaccine doses that will be available um, for um, supply to the rest of the population. And this is just another schematic that gives you a sense of that, which is where are we now? We're about to enter phase 1A, again, focused on healthcare personnel and residents and workers of long-term care facilities before moving up to essential workers and adults with high-risk medical conditions or um, age over 65, who would be at greater risk for severe COVID infection. In terms of this initial allocation of vaccine that we're expecting, um, what uh, California recently learned from the federal government is that they will receive about 327,000 doses up front. Um, there are a variety or a number of regions within California that will get a supply of the vaccine. Uh, Santa Clara County is part of what's called region two, which will get about 81,000 doses. Santa Clara County itself is estimated to get about 17,550 doses, although these numbers are a little bit uh, in, in uh, flux as there may be um, 
uh, uh, reallocation of some of the Santa Clara County doses elsewhere, but roughly about 17,000 doses. And then the Santa Clara County Department of Public Health will make a determination of how to distribute those doses across Santa Clara County to the different long-term care facilities, hospitals, and clinics. But there is an expectation, if all goes smoothly with um, VRPAC tomorrow, um, that uh, the vaccines could be coming as soon as next week. There are a couple of really important considerations when we're thinking about the COVID vaccine, some of which we've already kind of addressed. One is that, of course, this initial supply of vaccine is anticipated to be relatively limited. So there will have to be a sub-prioritization, meaning um, even all of the healthcare personnel and long-term uh, long care facility uh, residents and workers are unlikely to uh, receive the vaccine upfront. So hospitals like Stanford, um, Lucille Packard, El Camino, are working on sub-prioritizing, for example, the healthcare personnel that will get uh, vaccine earlier um, and the different sequencing of vaccine um, moving forward as additional doses become available. I think it's important to remember the vaccine is quite reactogenic, um, similar to what we would see with other vaccines, but this does have an impact in terms of staggering vaccination. If we were to vaccinate um, all of the nurses, for example, that were in our pediatric ICU at the same time, um, it is, we fully expect that some of these uh, people will have things like low grade fever, um, uh, pain at the injection site, a variety of other um, uh, reactions which might limit their ability to come into work for the next day or two. And we don't want everybody calling out sick the day after they get the vaccine and, and not have appropriate staffing. So that, those are the sort of considerations that we're having at the hospital. And of course, we have to think of a strategy about how to handle healthcare personnel who have these systemic symptoms, in particular differentiating what we might expect as an adverse uh, reaction or an expected reaction following the vaccine versus and distinguishing that from um, actual COVID infection. Because obviously um, a, you might have a little low grade fever from the vaccine, but low grade fever can also be a symptom of COVID infection. There are some just practical considerations like the way that these uh, vaccines need to be stored. Pfizer is probably the most complex. It requires ultra cold storage at minus 70. Um, and uh, this is really important because not every uh, you know, hospital clinic facility has the ability to store this vaccine at these kinds of temperatures. This vaccine also um, requires quite a bit of, um, or has like a relatively short uh, shelf life once it's been reconstituted. So once you sort of pull this vaccine out of ultra cold storage, you need to use it quite quickly and you need to be ready to administer all of the doses that can come out of that single vial. Um, just wanted to remind everyone that there are multiple redundant safety and reporting mechanisms that have been developed for other vaccines. Um, but in addition, um, new strategies that have been developed for the COVID vaccine in particular. Um, again, what we know based on the 40,000 some odd patients that have participated at least in the Pfizer trial is that there are really no serious safety signals within the first two months of having received that second dose. And typically when we're looking at vaccine safety, we're looking for um, most, or we would expect most of the adverse events to happen within the first six weeks of receiving a vaccine. So the fact that we're not seeing anything two months out is really quite reassuring, but just wanted to, to also make sure people were aware that there are a variety of safety mechanisms in place for this vaccine in particular. And wanted to just close by reminding the group that we're all very excited about the COVID vaccines that are coming online, beginning with the Pfizer vaccine. And uh, I guess I'll point out also that the Moderna vaccine, which has been in the press quite a bit as well recently, will be going to the FDA for a similar emergency use authorization request next week. But just to remind everybody that, you know, as these vaccines come online, it will still be very important for all of us to continue doing exactly what we have throughout this pandemic um, to protect ourselves and others, including covering your mouth and nose with a mask, um, good hand hygiene, and appropriate uh, social distancing. Um, and again, just wanted to keep it really high level, wanted to introduce people to, you know, some of uh, the concepts around vaccine that we're facing right now. I mean, in the last minute, uh, five minutes or so, um, open it up to questions that people might have in that kind of whirlwind tour that I just gave you. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, I know I have tons, but I think I know how to reach you, Hayden, now that I met you virtually. Um, we have a couple in the queue, so let's just go. Um, uh, my stupid chat box just keeps moving up. Um, who was the first one? Uh, Michelle. Michelle and then Theta. Yep, I um, have been looking at the tier 1A and tier 1B 
I own a, a private duty custodial care company where we send caregivers into people's homes. I haven't really been able to, to figure out. It looked like at first it was going to be 1A, and then it looks like it's 1B. Do you have any clarity on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think that there's going to be additional guidance forthcoming. I really do expect that by the end of this week, we're going to have a little bit more granularity about how 1A and 1B are being deployed. I do think, um, just broadly speaking, we want to make sure that we're thinking about the outpatient and home setting as well as the inpatient setting. So we've gotten a lot of questions about, is this really just for hospital, people who are working in a hospital? Because obviously there's a lot of care that's happening out of the hospital, both in the outpatient setting, and then as you're alluding to, in the home setting. And so I do think um, people are looking very broadly at making sure that we're capturing healthcare workers and um, at-risk populations and across basically the ecosystem of healthcare settings. Um, that's about as specific as I can give you, but I do think that as we get additional details from ACIP and from VRPAC following the meetings this week, um, we'll know a little bit more about the specifics of that. Okay, Sita, you have, we're, we're gonna try and do one minute of questions. So we can maybe do three more questions. Okay. So Sita, you're up. I, I had a question about the sample size. Um, I guess there is a concern about the sample because I assume you used healthy individuals for the vaccine um, and now you're going to give it to people that are at risk. So, I mean, it's more, a, it's more a fear question, but people are going to be asking me this. So I, I wanted you to address that. Yeah, that's a great question. So among the people that were included in the initial Pfizer studies, and that's really what I'm going to focus on because that will be the vaccine that comes online first. There were patients who had underlying chronic conditions who would put them at risk for severe COVID. There were also elderly patients who would be at higher risk for severe COVID. And when we look at the efficacy of the vaccine, they did multiple sub-analyses for uh, patients with underlying conditions, patients who are elderly, um, and they really didn't see any differences in vaccine efficacy based on substratification of those different groups. So based on the data that we have, it does appear to be both safe and efficacious across all of those different groups. Obviously, um, it's hard to capture all of the different populations that are at increased risk for co severe COVID infection, but there was across the sampling of, of people who were included in these studies, patients with underlying conditions, things like obesity that we know puts people at increased risk for severe COVID who were included and the vaccine appeared to be um, efficacious across all of those different groups. Another population um, that uh, people have been very concerned about is pregnant uh, women and women who are lactating. Um, those women were intentionally not included, but as is the case in any vaccine study, some women became pregnant um, along the way because either they didn't realize they were pregnant or they didn't know or they became pregnant. And the data that we have so far suggests that there was no safety signal, but obviously it's very early. And I don't think any, I think what's going to happen is that it's going to be a relatively permissive uh, guidance in terms of pregnant women and lactating women because we don't have enough data to, to support efficacy or safety in that population just yet. Okay, um, I think Hayden, you might be up, but um, Alice, did, did that answer your question about the when the vaccine is available for different groups? Uh, no, because the real question I have is, how will we be as the general public? How will we be notified? If you, I know, understand about one A, one B, but uh, how do you? How will we be, receive notices from our doctors' offices, from the hospital? Who, who lets us know it's available, or do we just keep asking? <laughs> no, that's a really important question. I think one of the things we are working hardest on right now is communication and messaging. Okay. Um, I can tell you that Stanford um, has a plan for basically like blast messaging beginning um, later this week. I've already seen some messaging that's come out from um, Kaiser. I've seen some messaging that's come out from UCSF as well. Okay. Um, and I, you know, there's a lot of complexities with the Pfizer vaccine. This is not a vaccine that you're going to be able to just go pick up, for example, at Walgreens and CVS right. because it requires these, you know, very complicated storage and uh, reconstitution procedures. And so I do think that this will also evolve as different vaccines come online. Obviously right now and in the next four to six weeks, frankly, I think the focus will be on 1A um, and those healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents and workers. Right. Um, and I think what happens with the broader population, including those who are at risk, will be a little bit of a moving target. But I, you know, what I've seen so far is that um, the places that have the vaccine are trying, or who will uh, have the vaccine initially are trying to be very transparent. But as you mentioned, communication and messaging of all that will be very important. Um, and I think it will be a little bit specific to the vaccine and to the healthcare system. 
Thank you. Okay, I know, I'm so sorry folks, I know it's a lot of questions, but Dr. Adams from El Camino may hopefully be able to answer the questions that are remaining in the queue. Hayden, thank you so much. I don't know if you're still honored. Yeah, you are. Um, thank you. We are probably not done with you. We'll probably invite you back at a later time um, as, we, as we get more information about the vaccines and, and whatnot. So I hope you um, don't block me <laughs> and we can reach out to you for an, another future meeting. Yeah, anytime. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you so okay. much. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, I just did get a text. Uh, Dr. Adams will be joining us in just a minute. So um, I suppose I could do an interpretive dance during that time, but I won't. Um, <laughs> what I will say is that um, the other the other part about uh, the, uh, the presentations that we have is that if you have questions and they don't get answered, please send them, go ahead and send them directly to me. Um, I will collect them. I will get them off to our medical experts and get you back answers as, as quickly as we can. We realize though that this is a very, very, very fluid situation. Um, in fact, the message that um, the number of doses dropped came out about an hour and a half ago because um, I'm on the same copy stream. So <laughs> that's, that's how quickly these, these things change. Um, but I do think that the general tenets that are being presented are, are good, which is that we are going to have to do this in tranches. We are going to have to do this in a measured fashion. And we also are going to have to be you know, quite, not just patient, but uh, we're going to have to be vigilant um, as we go forward. One of the things that uh, they showed on Monday was that the spike that we just, are, well, that we're currently living through is twice the size of what the spike was at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, yeah. Just a quick reminder um, from one of the reminders, if you didn't know this, but Matt Savage from Supervisor Submitting's office just um, chatted to me that if you have any questions about vaccinations, his office is always available. So reach out to, um, to Matt over at Supervisor Submitting's office. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Hi. Well, hello, everybody. Dr. Adams, great to have you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for inviting me back. So, so yeah, we just heard a little bit from, from Peter Katz, who's on the stakeholder vaccination group. And then we had Dr. Schwenk from Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, Stanford Children's Health, talk about vaccinations. But we have a lot of questions. Definitely want to pick right. your brain. And so yeah, the floor yeah, is yours. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, there was just a question that Kathy asked about the definitions of long-term care facilities and CCRCs and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I just wanted to understand, you know, when they talk about um, in the early, very early phases of um, giving the uh, immunization to people in long-term care facilities, what exactly is the definition of a long-term care facility? Oh. What does it include? What doesn't it include? Yeah, it's mostly, I mean, by and large, it's nursing homes, you know, um, and skilled nursing facilities, you know, SNF, that's what we call them. And, you know, they're, they're, most of them are generic. There are some specialized ones and, and they would be, you know, included. I would also, you know, I would think that as you go down the priorities, um, there's also uh, uh, basically, you know, cares so like senior care living centers uh, might be a second group of those. But technically, it's really the, the SNFs, the, the uh, skilled nursing facilities that where all these outbreaks are occurring. I think they're the ones that really get the priority. And another one in that category is um, they call LTACs, long-term acute care facilities. Um, we, don't, we don't have any right here in our county, but those are, um, those are, are places that are sort of like a step below a hospital where patients that really need more intensive care but don't need to be in the hospital anymore would go. Um, they definitely would be uh, included in there. What well. about CCRCs where you have a range of care that could include skilled nursing, but then also includes independent living? You mean like the terrorists? Yeah, I think those would definitely be looked at too. Yeah, what? yeah, those would be looked at too. And, and by the way, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what, you know, what you've already heard. Uh, I did um, yesterday have a meeting with the, with the board that I'm on in Portland, Oregon, um, by Zoom. Um, so I had a look at the Washington, Oregon, Utah, Idaho, because this company is a Blue Cross Blue Shield company, covers all of them. Each, each state has a somewhat different priority list um, of who gets what 
vaccine first. Um, I think the California one is good. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, hit the frontline workers first, followed by those high risk areas, which you're talking about, you know, the long-term care facilities. So it sounds like seniors that are living in an independent living setting who are part of a larger co complex could be in the very early yeah. phases. Okay. Yeah, I think they could. And, and, and the other thing is the next category they fall into anyway, usually is that the uh, at risk yeah. by age, right? Because the age risk is still pretty, is real, even though there's a lot more younger people getting sick. Um, if you look at the stats, you know, it's still the high death rate is in that older population, 70, 80, 90. Those are people mostly that are dying. So yes, so they would qualify as high risk. Thank you. Diana, are you still That's running this meeting or? He comes off mute. Free for all. Oh. He distracted. So, um, Dr. Allen, tell us what is, what are you, can you just talk to us a little bit more about the vaccination? What are you hearing from, from, from your sources? Well, one, I mean, it does appear to be effective um, with, a, with a pretty good, you know, percent, 94, 95%. So that's good. Um, it does take two doses to really get the full immunity. You know, that's, so that means it's a, that means once it even starts, you know, you have another three to four weeks really of delay before the, the you know, effective immunity kicks in. Um, I think that, you know, it's going to be, I, I, I really think, um, and then of course the limited supply, but I think that will improve because there's several other companies, you know, that are getting emergency authorization also. Um, we're really just going to see the first round from Pfizer, you know, probably next week. But I think the thing is, um, what we don't know is one, who will be, uh, accept the vaccine, you know, because I think, you know, one question is, are people going to refuse to, to vaccinate or not? Two is really how long will it take to get up to about 70% of the population vaccinated? That's what you need to really uh, have herd immunity. Um, and so it, to me, it's a combination of uh, acceptance, you know, who is going to accept it, and, and hopefully that's a high percentage, but we don't know because, as you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, anti-vaccination sentiment, you know, in the population in the U.S., and then two is, you know, how, how long will it take to get enough to get up to that sort of 70% magic, you know, immunity level, so, so, so I think that, so I think what we're going to end up with, um, you know, is sort of trying to do multiple things at once, trying to get people vaccinated, trying to take care of a lot more people getting um, sick from COVID because the rate's gone up. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think the next, you know, the first quarter and probably even into the second quarter of, of 2021 is going to be very messy. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I know that you, pro you, pro you probably heard already um, in England because they've been starting to administer the vaccine. There's, all, there's already been a little bit, so a few problems, um, a few um, allergic reactions that were pretty serious, you know, and so, and it, it's not surprising, you know, we, we will see that, but, you know, those are the kind of things, again, it's not so much, you know, f f that can be dealt with, but then will that scare other people you know, into not taking the vaccine. I think that I think those are some of the unknowns we're looking at right now. So let's go into some questions. Um, I have a couple, but Mike, you said you had some questions. Do you want to go ahead and, and ask them? Uh, sure, um, Dr. Adams. A uh, couple quick questions. We keep hearing about Pfizer's uh, sort of doses hitting the market, um, but right. nobody's talking about Moderna. Have you heard anything about how much, uh, how many doses Moderna is going to be putting into the market? And then I also had a, just a quick up, if you could give us a quick update on how El Camino is doing. Uh, we keep hearing we're nearing capacity in the county, but they don't break that out. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. Um, I don't know how many doses Moderna is, is, is producing. Um, I think, you know, Pfizer has said 10 million on, in the first round. 
Um, but I don't know about Moderna. I, I would think it would be similar, but I just, I honestly, I don't know. But they're very close. They've already applied for their emergency use authorization. So that should be coming soon. Um, and so, yeah, we'll see. They're both, they're both similar. They're, they're mRNA based um, spike protein, you know, um, blockers. So yeah, and as far as El Camino, um, you, know, you know, we certainly are feeling the surge. Um, you know, we went with, we probably had six to eight COVID patients in the hospital for several months running. And now, um, you know, today we have about 40 uh, in the hospital. And so it has, we've certainly uh, seen that increase. Uh, on, the, on the bright side, um, we've had uh, since February, in fact, I just, you know, put this together since February, I believe we've had um, no more than five employees who have gotten COVID from uh, work related uh, from a patient. Um, we've had about 55 who have turned positive um, from community exposures, a family member at home, spouse has it. Um, and even that is pretty low uh, given you probably read that, you know, the Mayo Clinic, uh, almost a thousand of their employees turned positive out of 3000 employees. Um, and so we're running an extremely low rate uh, as far as that goes. Now we do have now more people on quarantine, um, which we're keeping, you know, a close look and that's about 50 also. Um, and these are people that have known exposures, but they're not sick. Um, they're, they, you know, they test negative, but we have to keep them out for a certain period of time. So we have a number of those. Um, I think, you know, one thing, and of course, there's always unintended consequences, right? But you know, California passed the law that, you know, requires employers to provide 14 days of paid time off if someone's had an exposure. Um, there may be a few people taking advantage of that because uh, if you call up and say, hey, I had an exposure, then you get a 14 day holiday, paid holiday. <laughs> but um, I don't think that's, I don't think that's happening much. But so those are the kind of things we're, we're tracking. Um, we still have plenty of PPE. Um, you know, we really, um, yeah, oh, the good news is, I guess, that the, the patients are not as sick as some of the ones we saw at the beginning in February and March. Um, some of that's because uh, the age, the demographics have shifted downward. There are a lot more younger people getting sick than older people, other than the nursing homes. And so, um, mortality, the deaths is really uh, pretty minimal, um, you know, by comparison to the numbers that are surging. So actually, in some, some respects, the death rate is going down um, while the numbers of cases are going up. And most of the, we, and so of those 40 patients or so we have today, uh, there's only three on a ventilator. I think that's the other big issue. If you remember at the beginning, Lots of talk about ventilators, not enough ventilators, um, people struggling with that. Um, we have more people on ventilators that do not have nothing to do with COVID than we do with COVID. So um, like I said, I think that's at least sort of some, some good news and what we are having to deal with. A lot of it is really just people need to have um, some support uh, to get through it, like oxygen and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that's what we're dealing with. Are people getting my one of the uh, thing that, uh, out here? Yeah, we have it. You know, we have it in stock. <clears throat> I will tell you though, honestly, it's not that great. Um, first of all, you have to be careful. You, you really, it's not. It's not designed or should not be given to hospitalized patients. It really is strictly for people with mild to moderate um, disease. Uh, and it's to try to prevent worsening of the disease. Uh, but if you give it to somebody who has worsening disease, it can actually make it worse. I know. So there's, there's a lot of um, asterisks on that, you know, in terms of who really uh, can benefit from it. But we do have it. We have used it. Um, it you know, I think in certain, certain very select circumstances, it can work. 
it's kind of like the flu shot. You don't you don't normally get the flu shot when you have the flu. You got to get it when you're still healthy. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's, this is true. Yeah, this is true. Well, the, you know, the immune system is very complex. Um, you know, it works great 99% of the time. Um, but occasionally, you know, it's detrimental to us. Um, and so that's why we have to be a little careful with antibodies. Um, and, you know, steroids, another, it's another thing that, you know, we have to be a little bit careful. The people who, with COVID, who die generally or have the most severe illness are because the immune system overreacts. Um, that's really what causes the severe illness. Um, and so, again, you know, why does that happen in some people and not others? It, it, it's a complicated uh, system that we have that we carry around with us. We have a couple of questions in, in the queue, and I apologize for my dog and um, barking in the background. Um, so oh, we know we're gonna, we have the vaccinations coming. They're going to be staggered out probably to the most at risk or, or Yep. When do you think by then, and another maybe by 2022 or late 2021, where the general public will have access to the vaccination? Oh, I think the general public will have access in the spring, for sure. Okay. I, I, think, I okay. would say by the end of the first quarter, um, I would expect the public to have um, a lot more access to the vaccine. And so with the idea that by summer, um, you know, we have the potential to getting up to that 70%. I do. Okay. I, I think there'll be a lot more produced. That's great. Um, and if anyone has a question, go ahead and I think just jump in. Um, but I do have one. So as, as a business organization, the chambers with multiple businesses of all sizes, what can we do to help? Well, yeah, well, um, that, 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 that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, first of all, just, you know, educating people, supporting people. Um, you know, one of the things, so I, I suspect that as time goes, you know, by next summer or so, if we do have more widespread vaccination, I suspect there will be um, vaccination certificates. I think that people will may need to prove they've been vaccinated in certain circumstances, perhaps for the rest of the year, uh, in order to access, you know, businesses or do, you know, travel or do a number of different things. Um, I think that that opens up a door to potential fraud. Um, and, and before I forget, I also want to mention, um, we are seriously considering security measures um, for the vaccine. Uh, because already there's talk of organized crime, um, hijacking vaccines um, to resell them on the black market. Uh, so I think, you know, we're going to have to deal with that as well. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of, um, you know, what you could do, I think, I think for now, it's still so, no matter what vaccination is going on, I think the big thing, the most important issue is to help people understand that we still have to maintain the same precautions. You know, whether we're vaccinated or not, that's not going to really let anybody off the hook, you know, for in the near term, that we just have to keep up um, the masking, the, the, the distancing, you know, all that stuff. And, 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 you know, everyone gets weary of that. And I think anything you can do to help encourage that you know, your, you know, the businesses to encourage it um, with their employees, I think would be really, really helpful. I, I was just looking at, if you look at the, you know, the Institute for Healthcare Metrics and Evaluation, this University of Washington uh, group, um, they're, I think they provide good statistics, but if you look, they, they, they're now, you can see um, cell phone movement tracking um, which is a great indicator for whether people are social distancing or not. Um, and I would say, you know, California is better than some, um, but it's still in that mid range, lots of people moving around, lots of people interacting. Um, and again, that's where all these new cases, you know, get started. Um, anyway. Can I, can I just ask for my, so I'm, you know, we have so many now new vaccines coming. This is my, you know, I never thought in my lifetime I would be around when a new vaccine is being created. So 
When yeah. do we know when one is better than the other? Like, if I like the Moderna yeah. better than Pfizer, can I choose one over the other? I'm just, I'm just a little confused about that. Yeah, it's a good, that's a great question because in the past, who know, who, you know, who, who do you know where the flu vaccine came from? No, probably not, right? So that was really, they weren't branded before. I guess they're starting off, you know, that's sort of a branding. Um, you know, branded vaccine. It's a good, it's, you know, it's a good question. You know, the other challenge with the vaccine is we don't know how long it's effective yet because there hasn't been enough time where people have received it. You know, we hope and expect it'll be longer, not shorter, but, you know, right now we only know about three months, you know, of data so far. Um, and so, yeah, it's hard to know. I think, I, I think you'll find that, um, that those things will sort themselves out over time. You know, I think that the, 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 the one way to look at it is what the mechanism is, you know, of how, how it's supposed to work. The Moderna and the Pfizer are pretty much using the same approach. Um, and so if one is 94%, one's 95% effective, I wouldn't even pay attention to that. Um, you know, anything that's more than 90% generally, you know, is pretty good, right? So, yeah, I don't think there's going to be that much difference. Well, that's good you to know. I, I, was, I was impressed with the efficacy rate. That, that's really great. Um, good, yeah. We have you for a few more minutes. Are there any other questions or comments from the group? Diana, I just wanted to, to, to ask, um, you talked about the social distancing and the masking that we would need to continue yeah. to do. Yeah. And is that up through until we have herd immunity or what is, what does that really look like in practical terms yeah. and how does that relate to and this may be a little bit out of your sphere but you know we're concerned with reopening the economy being able to do the events that the chamber has traditionally done um and of course our businesses being able to operate at full tilt so i'd like to understand more about this um, about the masking and social distancing yeah, that, yeah, that that's a really good question. I, I'm going to show you something if I can share. I don't, can I share my screen? I um, believe you the, do have. Okay, let me. I'll show you. Yeah. So the you know the answer is, um, for the short term here, we're, we're, we really are going to need to continue to do those restrictions. And I would say, you know, realistically, um, probably until um, next summer, because here's the problem here, I'll show you this. Um, can you see that? Yes, yeah, so this is the projected deaths. Um, but what you see is, you know, it keeps going up um, well into the first quarter. Uh, and so, even though while people are getting, and, and there's also, you know, there's a curve in there, the purple one, if you can tell the colors, that shows what rapid vaccine effect would have. But I think if you look at all of them, they're not much different. Um, and so we're going to continue to have to do, while we're vaccinating, we're gonna to have to maintain those pretty strict controls. Um, there's another one, let's see, well, yeah, I don't, I guess I don't have it here, but, <clears throat> There's another graph you can you can look at on this site that shows um, in the absence of the masking and the social distancing restriction over the next several months the death rate really shoots up um, and so you know I think we're still going to have to maintain that um, like I said at least at least through the first quarter maybe the second quarter but I would hope by the third quarter um, I think things should lighten up. Um, if you think about it, you know, part of the problem we're in at the moment is because of the lightning that we did do, um, which makes sense, right? Because it was relatively low, we started to lighten up, but you can see it really um, backfired on us in some respects because now, you know, we're having to, to close down again, which, you know, I think you all know this better than me, but the last thing anybody wants to do is start up and stop again. Um, I, I think that's really harmful to businesses. Uh, I know that, you know, this is, you know, creating a lot of, um, you know, struggle for businesses. And 
So I think we've got to make sure this time that we that it's under control adequately. And like I said, it's just it's just going to take more time to do that. Dr. Adams, do Mike, you know, I mean, is anything happening like with daily self-testing? I mean, I there's been a lot of talk uh, stuff about why that isn't happening, and if people could wake up in the morning on a daily basis of yeah. testing and know. <laughs> Don't go out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I two thoughts about that. One, as time goes on, we will have more testing capacity and ability. There are now some self-administered, uh, call them spit tests, right? You can do your own spit into a and send it in, and and that's that will become more available. Um, I know uh, one of my colleagues has a son at the University of Illinois. And so every, every th three times a week, I guess every other day or so, they have to spit and, and submit. And then they get uh, the results on their phone. They have an app on their phone. Anytime they go to class, they have to show their phone app that shows that they were negative that day. Um, I think we'll, we'll get there. I think that's, that's just a matter of production um, and then making sure that it's, that it's accurate. Uh, so I think that that, I think that will come. But the other thing is, um, let me let me show you one more thing. I know I don't want to uh, take all your time, but this this is really this is so important. Let me show you this. Testing. Here's the limitation of testing: is really if you take a look at this, <clears throat> um, if right at the beginning, at this low part of the curve, there's the little coronavirus infecting you. You know, there's a period of time where you're not, you're going to test negative, but you're starting to accumulate and shed the virus. And so if you got tested on this day, uh, can you see my mouse? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So you get tested on this day, you're negative. The next day, you're, you're producing massive amounts of virus and you're infecting everybody because you're not sick. You don't get sick until over here. Um, and so... The, and this is why we're having this problem is because we have these people in this window, two day window, who they don't know they're sick, they think they're fine, they're out and about and they're just shedding virus like crazy because that's really the peak. Um, then as you as the illness, you know, it goes down again, but, you know, as long as we have this problem, you know, the even testing alone is not good enough because on, you know, this day you're zero, the next day, you know, you're going to be positive. Um, and you don't know it. I, I, I really think this is why this is so insidious, this particular virus, and why we're having this trouble. Um, that really sums it up right there. Dr. Adam, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing oh, your sure, wisdom. Um, if you want to end it with a positive um, note, no words of wisdom, feel free. The you have the, the last words. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, we'll get through this, you know, in a year or two, we'll look back and then you can tell your, your grandchildren, I will, I lived th through the COVID era, <clears throat> um, but we will get through it. I, I really have a lot of faith and confidence in our scientists and, um, you know, if you think about it, the speed at which, you know, these vaccines are being produced is incredible. That, that never would have happened 10 years ago. You know, the, the science has gotten so sophisticated um, and our healthcare system. I mean, you know, I think we're, you know, all in all, we're actually doing pretty well. Um, it's just that, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's a, it's a steep hill to climb, but we will get through it and um, I'm, I'm sure we'll be okay. Uh, and I, I know that when I look at the forecasts, um, you know, I think economists are saying, you know, once well, by next summer, once we do get this under control, I think there's a lot of built up uh, economic growth just waiting to happen. Um, so I think we'll be okay. I do. Thank you again. And I hope you don't mind if we invite you back at a future meeting. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Happy holidays. Anytime. Thank you. Yeah, thank, um, thank you so you much, all. Dr. Adams. You're uh, welcome. To the group committee, thank you all so much for hanging with us. Um, I know we're about three minutes over and I pride myself on starting and ending things on relatively on time, but I think this was really informational. 
jam-packed with information, I know. But thank you all so much. Uh, we will meet in January. And is there, any, is there anything else, Peter, to, to say? No, only that uh, really appreciate um, everybody sitting through this and also dealing with the fact that, you know, we're dealing with medical professionals who are being called out of the room moment on a moment's notice. And I just am very, very grateful to not just Dr. Adams and Dr. Mm -hmm. Schwenk, but also to, to Jonathan and to others who helped to make all this happen. It just, uh, it's hard to coordinate everything, as you know, and, uh, but I, I really appreciate everybody's uh, cooperation on that. And most importantly, I just want to say, um, stay safe out there. Um, you know, th that's one of the things, I think the overall message from all of this is that there is no silver bullet. It's a combination of things and it's all about us being very, very um, respectful and, and uh, sensitive to what's going on and to each other. So um, this is our last bit meeting of the year. Um, I want to thank everyone for their uh, cooperation and participation. Uh, looking forward to starting it up in January. Uh, for another great year.